You are watching With a Cup of Tea, the High Plains Book Awards edition, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings, Montana. Now here's our show. Well, welcome to This House of Books. We have with us today uh, Lisa Christensen. She's uh, an art historian uh, who has a, a book out now that's a uh, finalist for the High Plains Book Awards. And we're going to talk about the book in a minute. So, uh, maybe, but first, let's talk a little bit about you, Lisa. Tell us a little about yourself. Well, I'm a Canadian art historian, and I was drawn to that because I've always loved writing, and writing is a huge part of being an art historian. It's one thing to look at works and understand them and learn about them, but you then have to communicate that to other people. That's our job as art historians. And despite the fact that I started out in fine arts at U of C here in Calgary, we had to take an art history class, which I did. And within the first probably six weeks of my first term at U of C, I knew I'd found my faculty. So I switched over into that faculty and then landed a job at Calgary's Glenbow Museum shortly after graduating and went from there. 30 years in this field and I had the great fortune of in early in my career of working, I was a very junior curatorial assistant at the time, which means your job is to do what the curator tells you. And one of the things I was told to do was to check off all these paintings on a list as they came out of their crates. And it was an exhibition of works by Lauren Harris, one of the founding members of Canada's Group of Seven and fell in love with them, fell in love with the mountain work in particular, and connected with one piece that happened to be of a place I'd been camping the weekend before. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, yeah so that was... And you, you camp, and, and so what happened then? I mean, there's a, a, a story behind this. There's a great story behind this, a great story for me. The, the greatest um, stroke of luck and the most wonderful opportunity that you could ever be handed. As an art historian, it's not, it's not an easy field to, to work in, and it's a little bit of a niche for sure, but this exhibition was called the, um, it was called North by West, the Arctic and Rocky Mountain Paintings of Lauren Harris. And the painting that I'm referring to was a picture of Berg Lake at Mount Robson in Mount Robson Provincial Park, British Columbia. So my husband and I had been hiking there, camped there for three days in the pouring rain the weekend before. And this painting came out and I looked at it and it was, wow, I was just there. And I said to my boss, I just camped there. And he said, that's nice. And off we went to the next one. He didn't think too much of it. And um, he's a great guy, don't get me wrong, but uh, he, he wasn't a hiker. And so he didn't connect with it in the same way that I did. And so this was in the 80s, so it was black and white file photographs on a black and white photocopier. So that went into the photocopy machine, the file photo, and I took it home and showed it to my husband and he was much more interested. And, and that was the beginning of just taking copies out of books, going to the library, well before internet access to images. You couldn't Google map anything, you couldn't travel the world in a drone image like you can now. So searching out the images and stuffing them into my backpack before I went hiking and just wandering around the woods for really for fun and enjoyment and because it gave me this even deeper connection with places that I already loved, the mountains of Western Canada. And uh, 30 years later, that's turned into four books. So This is, uh, you have a series, uh, Hiker's Guide to the Art of the Canadian Rockies. And uh, so, that's where it came from, this inspiration. That's where it came from. Yeah. That's where it came from. And it's funny because there, there wasn't a, a great warmth for it in the art world when it first happened. But I've always looked at it, I've looked at it very simply. If you're looking at a portrait of an individual, in order to fully understand that painting, you want to know as much as you can about the sitter, whoever it is in that picture. And um, I guess the downside of that is portraits of people who aren't famous or interesting are often less regarded than those of people who are. And the group of seven, you know, a hundred years ago, came to the West to paint some of the places that are our most iconic places now like Lake Louise in the Canadian Rockies, Mount Robson, the place that started it all for me. And 
and I've branched out from those iconic places and well-known painters into quieter places and lesser known painters, making that same connection between the place as the subject of the work and my experience and the experience of others when they hike there and travel there. Well, tell me, tell me about Walter Phillips. So what do you find in, in his work? He just was so incredibly dedicated to his craft, to his media, to the watercolor itself, to the color woodblock print, which remarkably he taught himself, and to the black and white wood engraving. And he was so good at what he did. So we have this misconception that printmaking might be easy and watercolor is easy. That's a huge misconception. And any artists who are listening to this or watching this will know that the opposite is true because watercolor is the cruelest taskmaster that there is. You, can, you make a mark and it is there forever. You can never unmake fix, change, or rework that mark, it is there. And so if you look at any of Phillips's watercolors, especially for um, the mountains, where if you look at the ridge line as the silhouette of the mountain, uh, like, like the profile of an individual, you know if you know that mountain, if it's accurate or not. And so Phillips did these watercolors in the field on a full sheet of paper with all the weather that the mountains have, and they're exactly accurate. That's one thing, but they're incredibly beautiful. That's another thing. But the beauty of his mark making, they are often completely flawless. The blooms of color in them. He was a, a lover of the Japanese school of printmaking, the Edo prints, pictures of the floating world, and wanted to emulate that quality, that feel, that feel of, of beauty, of serenity, of almost otherworldliness in his work. And so his control of pigment on paper is a remarkable thing. And I, I thought I knew about him before I started to really research in depth, but what I learned over the course of that study about how fastidious he was, everything from he made, he made his own brushes, he changed all of his materials so that the sizing, the binding that holds the particles of color together in the paint and that holds the fibers of the paper together, they have the same sizing in them. So they, they talk to each other perfectly. So paint flows onto paper in a certain manner. He controlled everything. I'd say today we would, we would say he's um, definitely OCD, but in the most wonderful way for us because he understood everything and he, he made it uh, perform to its absolute peak level. So powdered pigments that he ordered weren't fine enough for his watercolors, so he reground them. So if you imagine you get powdered paint, mail order, it's the consistency of flour. <clears throat> he reground it so it was like icing sugar. He did that with everything. He, he sized his paper, he took out the commercial sizing, resized his paper, um, made his own brushes, burned the ends of the hairs so they would all be rounded. Absolutely every aspect of his practice was taken to here. And the result is in the works. You see these, these qualities of lines, you see where wet on wet meets um, wet on dry paper, and you know this perfect edge matches the silhouette of Cathedral Mountain exactly, which is a remarkable thing. So I have great respect for his mastery of a very challenging medium and of him doing it at a time when it wasn't in vogue. Well, maybe, um... Do you have any examples that you could share with us? Uh, oh gosh, there's there's so many. Um, Valley of the Ten Peaks is one of my favorite watercolors by Walter Phillips. It is, uh, it's in the collection of the Banff Center, obviously in Banff, and so it resides in a collection not that far from the scene that the watercolor depicts. So this is a couple of valleys up in Banff National Park. And it has a combination of as hard as an edge can get in watercolor painting, which isn't very hard. So if, if you think of acrylic on board, you can make an edge that is an edge. And with watercolor, when you, when you create an edge, there's always flow. No matter how saturated your pigment is, and no matter how dry and crisply sized your paper is, there's always flow. So when you look at the edges in a Phillips watercolor, and they tell your eye exactly what's going on in that place, 
that's something very exciting to me that he that he could do that, that he knew he knew what was going to happen before it happened on the page and then in the forest in the the uh almost in the foreground and then on the log in the very near ground you have these lovely areas of wet on wet and yet there's still control there and it doesn't ever get muddy and so you have this lovely crisp the upper ridge lines of these mountains are so wonderful then you have this soft cloud above them and from that cloud if you're well if you go outdoors and you look up at the sky the clouds tell you how moist they are by looking at them how much rain is in them you can see exactly you know exactly what's going on weather wise in this watercolor and then you have this lovely misty forest and in front of it you've got this crisp lake this tiny little slice of crisply edged lake and then we come again into a nice soft soft near ground that takes incredible control and over a large sheet of watercolor paper to not have one mistake i don't think mistake was in phillips's vocabulary mistakes i would guess were probably destroyed we see a few things in his sketchbooks like rain blobs on paper and things like that but not in a finished work if we ever see anything like that it's usually happened well after the execution of the piece so so yeah so i think that um it's the beauty first and foremost that speaks to me in them and the incredible dedication to this this humble medium of watercolor that that we disparage very unfairly very unfairly well i i have to say i'm uh... I'm very interested. I, uh, you, you make a great case for further study on this. Uh, and of course, uh, your hiker's guide to the art of the Canadian Rockies can uh, really take you into the art. And, uh, they can. They so can. It's a great they can. Thank you. I uh, I have enjoyed it, and it's um, as much a gift to me as as the rest of us. And to you know to get out there, and these are things we can still do. They're pinpointed on a map, and all you have to do is go. Yep. Well, it's been great to talk to you today. So, uh, you as well, Mark. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in Billings sometime. Oh, that would that would be lovely. Uh, the last time I was in Billings, I was ten. So it would be lovely to get. I've driven by a few times on my way to Yellowstone, but I haven't stopped since. It would be lovely. Well, it's not that far from Calgary. It's not. Not at all. No. Not at all. So. Well, thanks so much. My pleasure. You have a great day. Take care. So long. Bye. This program has been produced by This House of Books in collaboration with the High Plains Book Awards. The Book Awards were established to recognize regional authors and literary work that examines life on the High Plains. Nominations will be accepted starting in January 2021 on the website highplainsbookawards.org.